I hope you guys are awake enough because we are about to go into the mind-numbing details of controller area network. And uh, I'm a little sheepish on this, uh, mostly because I'm rather passionate on this topic. This is a very important part of the solution in the system that we use in the Wake Speed product. It's one of our other key differentiators. Um, we sit on committees that define these standards. Um, you'll learn more about different standards, RVC. Um, I was actually the person who was in charge of the revision of the DC subsystem section of the RVC standard. So this is an area that we have a very firm understanding on. This is an area that provides a ton of value. And this is also an area, when it works, you want to treat it like Apple. So you know, I've always kind of impressed with Apple products that they do marvelous things. And they're fairly easy to use. I, a lot of people think they are. Some people have different opinions. They're fairly easy to use. You have no idea all the details that went on behind it. There is a ton of stuff that's going on behind it. I don't need to know all those details. I just know it's kind of easy to use. Control area network's the same. Um, the reason why I think I was asked to go into this as a deeper dive is because it is very prevalent, especially in the marine space. Not just with these high energy DC subsystems, uh, especially talking between displays and batteries and everything, but NEMA 2000, which I understand you guys haven't covered yet, but it is a very common communication method between things like GPS's and chart plotters and radars and radios and uh, AIS. I mean, all this stuff. If you've got a blob that has the opportunity to communicate with another blob, that's what CAN does. Okay. So, uh, CAN, in a sentence, digital communication method for the automotive industry to allow to transfer of information between two nodes. Can you feel the propeller starting to turn with that sentence? So that's exactly what I said. You got a blob here and a blob here. This is a way to communicate. It was developed by Bosch in the 80s. Uh, and really, what the reason for it was, is if you think about, I always use the Cadillacs. So the Cadillacs have all sorts of marvelous features. And if you go to a Cadillac from the 60s or even the 70s, and you look on the door, and it's got all these buttons and switches. I mean, you know, you can change the temperature in the trunk from a switch on the door on the Cadillac, right? But when you open that door, you're going to see a wiring harness about this big around. Because every one of those switches has a wire that goes from that switch to the thing that changes the temperature in the trunk. It's just amazing delivery of, 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 of value, but my lord, this big giant wire. What CAN does is allow you to send a message rather through a wire, but through a shared communication bus. So instead of having 10 switches with 10 wires, you've got 10 switches to talk to one CAN bus. And when the switch to change the temperature in the trunk wants to change that, when you push that up, that switch will send out a message over the CAN bus to the thing in the trunk that manages the temperature and they'll say, oh, somebody wants me to raise the temperature here. That's how that basically works. Whereas before you had a physical wire that went point to point, now you've got a shared bus. So that wiring harness in the Cadillac door went from this to two wires. You only need CAN high and CAN low. That's the value of CAN. There's a tremendous, there are a lot of other really good values that CAN does. It was developed by Bosch for the automobile industry. And the reason that we standardize on it, and this is where we're getting in the real nerdy details, it has built into the protocol things such as prioritization, things such as deterministic delivery. If I send a message, I know it will get there. And I know it will get there in time. And I also know if I send a message that has a higher priority, than somebody else. For example, in the RV industry, they use the CAN bus to, to connect that switch that moves the sliders in and out. That switch doesn't have a wire going down to it. It sends a CAN message, move the slider in, move the slider out. That switch has a higher priority than the CAN messages that go to the person who says, I want the coach to be warmer or colder. And the reason they do that is because that switch is human safety. So 
that prioritization that's built into the CAN protocol, it's a fundamental aspect of it. If, if one person's over there adjusting the thermostat and someone's trying to stop the slider because Junior's about to get mowed down, that prioritization will assure that the temperature is going to stay the same and that slider is going to stop. Trust me, I could go on and on and on more, but it is a technology that was developed to solve problems. It is a technology that is very well thought out. It is incredibly per pervasive. If you go into your car, it's all there. There are multiple CAN segments. I think a typical car today has anywhere from two to 400 things that are talking to each other. All on CAN bus, actually usually on multiple CAN buses. So there you go. I've kind of done my, uh, my, my big speech about the value of CAN bus and we'll move on. I'm going to give you now two words that's going to make you a CAN expert. You will be heads and tails above everyone else. And those two words are backbone and drops. Every CAN subsystem, every CAN network consists of a backbone and drops. There are different wiring systems. And we talked about these the other day. This is a wiring system based on RJ45s. This is a wiring system based on DTM, common in automobiles. This is where to go. This is a wiring system based on M12s. The connectors and the wires are all different, but they all share backbone and drop. So what does that mean? What it means that we have all these things that want to communicate to each other. Just think of them all lined up around here on the table. The CAN backbone, the CAN network, is a connection at the top, and then there's a T that comes off of it to each of the nodes. So every node that wants to talk has a drop. There's the backbone and the drops. And it doesn't matter, the easiest way to see this is in the N2K, because it is literally a backbone and they put t plastic T's in it that has a little connector on it that you can screw this into the bottom of it. And I'm sorry I don't have an example here. Uh, maybe we'll get one and we can show, we can show one. There might be one somewhere on here. Great example on the, uh, on the panel. Right? All right, perfect, yeah, you can go see them there. So yeah, it is the backbone and the drops. So those two words, and the reason I'm belaboring this is because the wiring system, the way you physically wire the backbone and the drops is rather irrelevant. There's some certain details, there's some impedance, twisted pair, all that kind of stuff. But by and large, they all are not relevant because they all are formed in backbones and drops. Even the RJ45 system, this little guy. The backbone, if I have a Victron guy over here, yep, blue for Victron, and the black one here that goes into wake speed, and then I carry on from this regulator to maybe another one, this becomes the backbone. I'll hold it this way, right? This becomes the backbone. The drop is inside the box. The backbone actually goes inside the box in this connector and comes out. And the drop is actually about three eighths of an inch between that and the little chip. It's still a backbone and a drop. If you can keep that concept in your head, that will help clarify a ton of issues that we, that we get when people get confused about what CAN is. I'm going to stop and breathe now. Does this help? Does this make sense? Yes. Perfect. I love that. The, uh, oh yes. Yeah. You mentioned that in some instances you're using multiple CAN bus systems. Yes. What is the advantage of having a setup that is used, I mean, why have two if you could have one? Correct. Why can't you have one? Yeah. I'll give you a perfect example. In the car, they'll have one CAN subsystem that's all the emissions and the ECU and the engine computer talking with all that stuff they'll have a totally separate CAN subsystem for the radio. And they do that for two reasons. There's so much traffic going on. And remember I told you about this deterministic stuff? It's really important that the engine, when he sends something out, he doesn't, he doesn't even want to have to deal with the fact that somebody's changing radio stations. Doesn't even want to consider it. And um, there's reason for that because the utilizations are so high in these type of environments. They're very closed that when you have this kind of prioritization thing, it can, 
you know, you, it's why you segment it. So there's a perfect example. Now, coming back to your world, to our world, it's very uncommon to have segmented cans. There are a couple of products out there that do can bridges. I think Digital Research, I think Marathon makes one. There might be a couple more. And what they'll do is they'll let you have one can network and a separate can network, and then you can put this bridge that has basically two drop points, so it lives in both network subsystems, and you can configure that thing to say, only pass messages from here to here, you know, these, don't send them all. There are, I've never seen those really used. There are some people who have installed them because they feel uncomfortable, they have a very rich, a very complex system. Uh, we will get into, uh, excuse me, one specific issue when we talk about CAN protocols, so make sure to remind me about bridges and why they might be used when we talk about the CAN protocols. Okay? Yes, sir? Could you just uh, give us a, a short list of what has emerged in the marine environment of the kinds of devices you can put on the CAN net? Uh, almost everything. Yo, there's kind of a statement that says everything's better with Bluetooth, right? These days, almost everything, I think, comes with CAN, with NEMA 2000-based CAN. It's very pervasive. Radios, AISs, you know, chart plotters, it's, it's very, very pervasive. And even many modern uh, engines. Oh, yeah. NEMA 2000 compatibility which means they'll come free with all their senders pre-installed, mm -hmm. your oil pressure, your coolant temperature, all, the, all the, the information you need to know that you would normally historically see on an analog a suite of instruments can all show up in like on a flat screen as Yeah, analog. exactly. They appear as analog instruments yeah. or We'll talk about that as some examples and stuff, but yeah, uh, CAN and NEMA is very, very pervasive. Um, pretty much everything. Did you have? I saw your hand go up quick. Is a backbone cable wired the same as a drop cable, and it's just how you hook them up into the system to make the network? So a backbone is, if you will, the freeway. And I don't like this graphic, but I had a graphic in that our marketing department complained about. So we're going to find a better one. <laughs> um, uh, the uh, the backbone is literally just think of it this way. Here's the backbone and then drops. And on the end of each drop is a device. Now, some CAN specs let you have multiple devices on drop, but we're not going to go into that subtlety. Just think of a backbone, a T, and drop to a device. Yeah, I understand that. Okay. If I go into my bag, yeah. do I have, and I'm setting up this network, do I have to be careful whether I pick up a backbone cable? Oh, I understand your question. So this is a detail of NEMA 2000. They make a difference, uh, they, they define a backbone cable and a drop cable. We're probably not going to get to that subtlety. Um, there are limits to how many devices you can add to a backbone. And that is sometimes depending in the case of NEMA 2000 about whether you use the thick cable or the thin. That is a level of detail and subtlety we're not going to have time to get into at this point. It is an area of study that probably takes a couple hours to kind of work through those permutations. Is that the question you're asking? Is there a physical difference between the two cables? Yeah, there is actually. The, the cables themselves will have, uh, in the NEMA 2000 world, the physical difference between the two is the, uh, mostly about the power carrier. Because in NEMA 2000, they run four wires, they run two for a twisted pair for the CAN network itself, the CAN high, CAN low, and then they also run power wires. So I think the physical difference between those two cables is mostly the power wires are bigger, um, but I don't recall, there may also be some additional shielding or something around the twisted pair. I don't recall that subtlety. Um, but if I happen to pick up a drop cable and connect it as a branch, yeah. it will work? It'll work, yeah. but. Uh, I'm putting a little asterisk there. Um, can, can, can hardware, the thing that actually does the hardware communication, is incredibly robust and incredibly reliable, and you can put a lot of crap into it and it'll still work. Just because it works now 
doesn't mean it's going to work tomorrow if you're on the edge. So this is where for each of the specs, RVC, J1939, NEMA 2000, there is a definition section that's anywhere from one page to many pages long that says this is how you can wire our system up, how big your backbone can be, how many drops you can have, what's the total distance, what's the total length. This all goes into signal theory and reflections and a lot of smart people have figured this out. So the real answer is, will it work? Yeah, it's probably going to work. But is it what you should do? No, you should look at the spec, see what it says, and, and engineer your system to the spec. Okay? All right. Um, the, so um, carrying on, I think that's it for this. I mean, we've got the physical wiring, which is a very important and, to be honest, the most trip up point that we have found when people trying to uh, install the wake speed regulator. They just get confused by all these options. So if you can remember that all of them deliver back one and drops, you can actually mix these different wiring standards. But I'm just going to suggest pick one. You do everything as NEMA 2000, do everything as RJ45, and move on with life. Uh, even though you can mix them, I'm going to suggest you don't. The other detail about this is at the end of the backbone, there is a terminator on each end, 120 ohms on each end. This is again, propellers turning hard now. This is a hardware signal transmission bus. And the energy has to be terminated or it'll be reflected and you'll get what's called nulls. If you don't absorb the energy when it gets to the end with the terminator, it will be reflected because of the impedance mismatch and it'll be inverted 180 degrees and you will get, it'll have to be a fairly long one, but you can actually, one can do the math. You will find some point if you attached a device right here, there'll be no signal. Because the original signal is coming out one way, the, R sig the reflected signal is coming out reflected, and they cancel each other out. So you get 10 minus 10, you get zero. You get, the, it's called nulls. So the termination is probably the second biggest issue that we have run across in CAN subsystems. They don't terminate it, or more commonly, they over-terminate it. And we're going to talk a little bit later about how you can do uh, testing for this. Uh, I'll just give you a quick hint. If your CAN subsystem is unpowered and you apply an ohm meter, that's 120 ohms, that's 120 ohms. Those two in parallel, you should see 60. If you don't see 60, if you see above it, you're, you're under-terminated. The system will probably work, not reliably. If you see 45 ohms or less, it's over-terminated. We have had a few support calls, and I, I'll pass this on because you're going to be dealing with customers. Well, when you do it, you won't deal with customers like this, but you'll have people bringing stuff in that says, I installed this, it doesn't work, can you fix it? I remember this one customer, we went round and round and round, and he wouldn't take the ohm meters. And finally, I talked him into doing it. And he said, huh, I've got 28 ohms. It's like, you have five terminators in your system. No, I don't, there's one here, there's one. Here. He went and found them, he found all, he finally got the 45 ohms. There was one more terminator. And the guy was arguing with me about this. Like, no, they're all, it's like, dude, this is a physics thing. I, I can tell you about the parallel resistors and why you got 45 ohms. He found the terminator it was in, the, in the base of the signal mask. The person, whoever did the install, they didn't have a backbone long enough to go up to the top of the mast where a terminator lived. In the base, they put a T in, and for some reason, they hid a terminator there. This guy, it took him like an hour and a half to dig that thing out. And I see the guys in the background going, oh yeah, we all have those stories. So that is, when we have issues with the can, that's probably one of the biggest issues of unreliability is improper termination. And I don't care if it's a wake speed or a NEMA 2000, it doesn't matter. That's probably the single biggest issue. All right, uh, I'm not going to ask questions because I know that uh, this is a lot of information to absorb. Yes, sir. I just want to uh, <laughs> let them know that almost every box when you unpack it, there's a resistor in, or there's a terminator in there. Mm -hmm. So people think, well, it comes in a box. It's in the box, so I used it. Yeah, I don't want spare parts. And you know what's absolutely the worst? There are some devices out there that build a terminator into the device. 
That is a total violation of all these specs, but they do it. So, and there's actually the REC BMS, the cable that they provide has a terminator built into it. So when we talk about different battery systems that we use, in that case, you either put the REC at the end, right? because it already has a terminator in it, or you have to figure, go and open the thing up and cut the terminator out. Another hint, um, since we're on this, is uh, some of the lithium systems and the lithium cables. They'll have terminating resistors built into their wiring harness. They will, you know, this, uh, this is black connectors, the type they use. You will find if you open the cover up, they'll actually have a 120 ohm resistor inside there. You have to read their specs very carefully and if you got a question, throw an ohm meter on. This thing should be open. If it shows 120, you got to find that resistor or use it, find that resistor and take it out or know that resistor is there and design it into your system when you design the system. Okay. All right. Hang on now. Colorful picture. CAN subsystem, the hardware consists of three wires, CAN high and CAN low. CAN high in this case is yellow, CAN low is green. This is the automobile standard. Here's where you can take some notes. In the automobile, this is the industry standard. CAN high is high, it's yellow like the sun. CAN low is low, it's low like the grass green and yellow. Remember I said yesterday, please don't hook this yellow wire up to your stator. This is the one you want to hook to the stator. Yeah, we've had people do that and wonder why it didn't work. Uh, so that's two of the wires. In the marine world, the NEMA 2000 uses blue and white. Can high is white like the clouds. Can low is blue like the water. You will never need to know this, but if you really want to whip that out sometime at a party and impress your friends, that's something you could do. So we have what's known as a differential pair. We already showed this on the backbone, right? Uh, we showed this in this diagram that there were two wires, a differential pair it's called. That's the signal theory. Now this is what actually goes across that differential pair. Can high, when you want to uh, send a zero, it's kind of weird. When you send a zero, you bring can high high and you bring can low low. So normally this is about a three and a half volt spread. So normally when there's a recessive state, you'll see it where the two signals are very close, if not exactly the same voltage, and it will usually sit around about um, two volts, two and a half volts. They'll both be the same. Then when you want to send a different something other than a zero or a one, when you want to send something different, those signals go apart. It's called differential pair. The reason this is done is for noise immunity. And I told you this is going to be a nerdy talk. The reason this is done is for noise immunity. If there's some radio outside interjecting noise, bang, or a stator wire or a field wire interjecting noise into this can pair, you'll have that noise travel through the air and intercept this pair. Ideally, theoretically, when it introduces noise into the wires, it'll introduce the same noise into both. So if we only had a uh, one wire and we, and we introduce noise, and let's say that noise brought this signal all the way down, it was strong enough to do that. Well, we would confuse this. We would think, oh wow, that changed. But because we have a differential pair, what it's going to do is going to bring both of those down. And when we receive it, we don't care what the absolute value is. If we had just one wire, we want to know if it's high or low. But if we have two wires, we only care if they're the same voltage or apart. And that's why this is higher noise immunity. It's also one of the reasons why I use twisted pair that also helps with noise immunity. Yes, ma'am. When you were describing the voltage of the two Mm -hmm. uh, communication was a zero and the one. Did mm -hmm. you say that when it was communicating the one, which is the voltage that is close together, it was sitting at 2.5 volts? Roughly, roughly. It's a passive state 
what's actually happening, what actually happens is the CAN transceiver, and this is another reason why we use it. There are like a bagillion of these things made. And probably one of the smartest chips inside this entire product is this little guy here called the CAN transceiver. They cost like 20 cents. And it's the one that does all that sending and receiving. So when it is in its uh, passive state, it's not doing anything. So that's where the resistors on each end pull those two wires together. That's no reason you have to have the resistors. Then if somebody along that network wants to send a signal out, they will drive this one toward five volts and that one toward ground. Does that answer your question? Um, and so on your diagram, is the small gap in between the one high and the one low, is that representative of 2.5 volts or are you, like, where are you measuring that? Yeah, that's actually the third wire. That's a great question. The third wire involved in this is the reference. And the ground wire is the third wire. So in the case of the NEMA 2000, remember I told you, that's a great question. Uh, in case of the NEMA 2000, I mentioned there's a red and a black, a power wire that goes with it. That black wire is the reference ground wire. In the case of, it's called an isolated, isolated CAN network. In the case of almost every other CAN network in the world, they don't do isolation and the ground reference becomes some ground reference. So like in the RV world, the reference point for ground is battery negative. Okay, so if you wanna measure a voltage, and I guess that's where you're going to, you would put your negative, your black probe on the battery ground and you'd put your red probe on either can high or can low. Okay, yes sir. The difference between NEMA 183 and 2000 in terms of the voltage differences and why 183 is preferred in commercial applications because yeah, I'll leave it at that. You know what? I'm going to be a little weak on this because I got to tell you. So 183 uh, controller area network can, which is what we're fixating on here. The hardware and what we're looking at here is a differential pair and how it communicates. NEMA 183 is based on another standard that's called RS-485. It's also a differential pair. Uh, you, in addition to 183, if you ever deal with solar controllers or even with Victron, the Victron VE bus network is an RS-485 signal. It's, sometimes, it's a lot of times called Modbus. Modbus is the protocol that is very prolific in those type of deployments, and we'll talk about protocols next. But it uses 485 as the underlying carrier. And the difference is, and this is why 485 is more robust, is whereas we use a five volt swing, I believe 485 uses 12 volts, right? Yeah. I think it's, you know, there's a spec range that you're allowed, but it's definitely bigger. So you have more difference between them, so you can get more noise immunity, so. That. But 480, um, the, the Modbus stuff, you know, obviously you're going to run across it a lot with the Victron equipment because it's very pervasive. Um, and then also if you have the 183. But that, the, we had the question the other day, why 183 and NEMA 2000 are incompatible. One of the reasons is that this is like the little five volt swing and there one's the big 12 volt swing. There's other reasons as well, but that's one, definitely one of them. Okay. Um, so I want to come back to kind of pester on this a little bit. I talked about nominal voltages that you'll likely see. The reason why, nobody's driving this to two and a half volts. The reason this ends up around two and a half volts is at this point somebody drove it to like high and low and then when people just let the car coast, that's what's happening here, it kind of settles down to somewhere in between. And it has to do with residual capacitance in, inside the whole transmission line. So you cannot go up to an inactive CAN network and put a meter on there and say, I don't get two and a half volts. That's not going to happen because no one's driving it to two and a half volts. That two and a half volts is an artifact of an active bus. The only way you're going to actually see this stuff is with an oscilloscope. Voltmeters, you can do some stuff, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but by and large, if you're to the point where stuff isn't working and you gotta get to this level, an oscilloscope's the only way you can see it. And I have no idea, is that the level that you guys are getting into at some point? I'm gonna show them on an 
Let's go, but we're not going to dive into it. We do have a couple adapters that we can put into the system, put into a computer, and then go back. Just to show it, yeah. Um, I will tell you, myself as an engineer, I love to bring my toys out. If any of you folks are in the field and you're feeling like you have to do it, you're way down a rabbit hole you don't need to be. You need to step back and remember the two magic words, backbone and drop. Verify your terminators. <laughs> That's going to cover 99% of any issues you will ever find with the CAN subsystem. So the other thing I wanted to show on here, and this is the most detailed slide we're going to do about CAN bus, and then we're going to, you know, come out of this ditch. There are defined in the controller area network two types of packets, and they're called standard addressing and extended addressing. And you look at this, this is actually what a CAN frame looks like. I've talked quite a bit about a packet gets sent. That's the packet. So when somebody wants to send battery voltage from the BMS to the wake speed regulator, it sends something that looks like this, a packet. It says, here's the packet, has battery voltage in it. In the front of the packet, there's some startup, start a frame, and this is so that little 29 cent chip can go, ooh, something's about to arrive, I should pay attention. Then there is the address. They call it arbitration here, but this is the address. And you'll notice that in this case, uh, let's see, which one am I on? Or did I copy two of the same? Well, I hope I didn't. Arbitration fuel control data. Oh, shoot, I gotta change this because I think I have two of the same. Um, this is the standard packet, it's only 11 bits. You can only have an address that's 2D11, which is 2048. So when a packet comes across, the protocol defines how this is going to be interpreted. What does this mean? So when a node receives one of these packets, they'll know, hey, this is something that I care about, or they'll say, I don't really care. So when the GPS receives the battery voltage, it's going to look at this part of the message, because that tells what the packet contains, and decide where it wants to pay attention to it or not. GPS is going to say, Psh, I don't care about battery voltage. The wake speed is going to receive a position, lat and long. It's going to say, I don't care about it, and ignore it. But when it receives a packet it cares about, then it will then carry on, and they'll look at the data. And uh, yeah, I actually did mess this up. What happens is, in the extended frame, is they have this front part here with, 20, with 11 bits, and then they sneak in more bits to get 29 bits of information, not just 11. That will become relevant here in just a minute. So you got the first part of the field that says, this is what this packet contains. And then the last part of the field is, here's the actual data. And you can only send a fairly small amount of data. It's amazing how big this thing is between the address and the arbitration and the uh, consistency checks to send a little bit of information, it's just amazing how much extra junk is packed onto this. But that's what partly makes these things reliable. In the data field is where I'll see the voltage or the current or the ladder long. And this, again, is defined by the protocol. If we're talking about the CAN system itself, the 2.0A, the 2.0B, as defined by Bosch, that this little 29 cent chip iron stands, he doesn't care what these bits are high or low. He just says, oh, look, I got 0001000. I'll pass it on to somebody and see if they want to care about it. So, yes, sir? So, isn't this arbitration field is sort of how they prioritize the messages? Yeah, yeah. What actually happens is, at a very, very technical level, remember how I told you that uh, the slider trumps the thermostat? The, the slider is going to want to send a much more of these active signals. So if at some point in time, the thermostat's trying to send a 0, 0, 1, 0, and the, and the slider's saying 0, 0, 0, the thermostat's trying to make that signal go low. Well, guess what? It can't, because it's not actively driving it low. The low is because no one's driving it. That's how that technically works at the hardware level. Because the slider is making that high, only his message will get through and the thermostat won't. Well, my question was, uh, is there any situation where you as a tech would be uh, changing 
being the priority, or is that just sort of hardwired into? Generally, it's hardwired in. It's, it's, hard, it's hardwired in. Yes. We actually will talk about priorities, but it's unrelated to this. The protocols themselves will define the messages and, and who is more important. And the way the protocol does it is it assigns the guys they care about more, more zeros. Okay. Now, actually, and that's the difference. I'm really kind of annoyed. I've got to fix this. In the extended address, in this 11-bit one, which you will find, it will be called the BE CAN, it will be called the Victron BMS protocol. Third parties, you have third party batteries that can talk to Victron. They use this 11 bit protocol. If you look at wake speed, we have stuff we call SMA, and we'll talk about this later today. There's different protocols that are this 11 bit. You can't send as much, this is what it is. Uh, there's not the ability, there's just not enough room. You pretty much send, here's something, deal with it, right? Whereas with the extended one, you can send, here's something, and here's a priority. And here's, a, um, and here's who sent it and here's who I want to receive it. You've got more room to add more information with the extended protocols. That's how NEMA 2000 works. That's how RVC works. That's how BE regs work, if you ever get into that detail. Very specific example to answer your question. Within RVC, there is a message that comes out with the battery voltage. And in the spec, it says it's got a priority that's pretty much equal to everyone. It's, it's just like a thermostat, right? Uh, and, and, oh, you should also know that anybody who's sending a message, they're monitoring to see if it goes out. So if that thermostat's message didn't go out, he'll just try again. And he'll just keep trying until it finally goes out. So everyone's kind of an equal playing field except for that guy in the slider because it's more important. In the RVC spec, where the battery sends out battery voltage and the battery sends out battery current, if the battery decides that those values are over its limit, the spec allows you to raise the priority of that message. And the idea is that the battery was trying to tell the world, here's what I'm seeing, here's what I'm seeing, and somebody's playing with the thermostat, and that message doesn't go out timely. And when you go over the limits, and the battery wants to tell the world, hey, listen to me, I'm overstressed, stop doing it, or I'm going to start pulling the ripcord, it lets the battery raise that priority, get that message out absolutely, deterministically, and the thermostat can wait. That's a very specific example. Unless you're a guy like me, you're never really going to pay attention to that stuff. Okay? This is massively more detailed than you will ever, ever have to experience. Uh, unless you want to buy a Raspberry Pi and a can hat, and do sniffing, then you're going to be at this level. Yeah, I know. I saw you pointing to him, and I was looking at him as well. <laughs> By the way, you can remind you, you can do it with the wake speed, too. Really expensive can sniffer, but, you know, it does the job. Uh, the walk away I want you to have from all of this is there is a ton of history. There are millions and millions of dollars that have gone into developing this incredibly robust reliable, pervasive, and relatively cheap method for nodes to communicate with each other. Okay. The next thing we're going to talk about is protocols, how we would interpret this information. So just remember, every CAN packet's got a header that says what this is, and then it's got the actual data. Does anybody have questions at this point, or are you really ready for me to move on? Good, I'm gonna move quick before someone thinks I'm on. All right, so some of this we covered a little bit. Uh, we're gonna talk about the protocol now. Up to this point, we're talking about the hardware. We've been talking about the backbone and the drops, the terminators, differential pairs. We've been talking about all that stuff. Now we're gonna talk about, and also what the packets are, you know, what a packet looks like. Now we're gonna talk about how packets are interpreted. And this is something called the protocol. NEMA 2000 is a protocol. RVC is a protocol. Those two protocols are pervasive in the marine world, in the RV world. NEMA 2000 has messages defined for Latin long. RVC has messages defined for sliders. 
I will guarantee you RVC, actually my RVC doesn't care about Latin long. I will guarantee you that NEMA 2000 doesn't care about sliders and they certainly don't care about locking the front door. I'm trying to see if someone picked up that reference. <laughs> so uh, there are protocols that are defined for a reason and specific to the industry to satisfy those needs. There are many, many other protocols. Because CAN is such a beautiful, wonderful way for two nodes to talk with each other, there are those used in the industrial industry. You know, if you've got process control, a lathe, a smart lathe that you program and communicate, very likely has CAN inside of it. There are lots of protocols. I've listed a few of them here. Uh, CAN King, CIA, CAN Open. Uh, you know, this just goes on and on and on. The ones we care about, there's three of them. Maybe four, but three primarily ones. J1939 and then RBC and NEMA 2000. J1939 is, think of it as the first floor of the protocol. They split, you remember I said there's 29 bits? They take half of that and say, this is for J1939. J1939 is what's in your car. It's what lets the engine start and the windows go up and down. It's what does a lot of details about nodes identify who they are and they register themselves on networks so everyone understands who all is out there and what they can do. That's all done on the first floor. That's J1939. It's called data page zero if you care. J1939 says we're going to have this other upstairs that we're just going to let someone else move into. And they can do what they want. Called data page one. That's where RBC lives. That's where NEMA 2000 lives. So J1939 is important because whenever we write a NEMA 2000 stack, we have about 15 messages in J1939 that we have to process. It's mostly around registering yourself on the network, making sure you have a unique address, you don't get conflicts, stuff like that. And then all the rest of the messages, the Latin longs and radios and AIS is on the second floor in NEMA 2000. Same with RBC. We have a J939 portion of our stack for the housekeeping, and then the second floor is, here's a slider, here's a battery, here's all this stuff. This is where the question came in about bridges. J1939 is the parent here. They're the adult in the room, and they live on the first floor. And they say, don't come down and be messing in my kitchen on the first floor. You have the second floor, do what you want. So the guys up on the second floor, the NEMA 2000, the RVC, they're, they're kind of greedy and they want the whole floor for themselves. So there is a conflict there. And that's where a bridge can come in uh, a little bit. And I, I guess maybe I'm actually gonna talk a bit more about that um, in a little bit. So, but just keep that in mind. So for us, through all of this stuff that I've been rambling on now for quite a bit, and then we may actually uh, be close to uh, doing a break. Uh, if you want, we're getting close to that. Okay, I'll look for a break time. Through all of this, what I want you to remember is the hardware aspect, backbone and drops, the terminators, the protocol aspects, the ones we care about are the 29-bit ones, the J1939 and the foundation, and then RBC. And because you're moving in, I'm sorry, Neiman 2000 in the marine world, and because you're moving into the high energy space RVC. And just so you know, the reason why that was done, NEMA 2000 is wholly, it has nowhere near enough capability to allow BMSs and stuff to talk with each other. They just, it's not the right protocol, won't work. That's why we do RVC. Alrighty folks, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, we have just spent a mind numbingly very shallow dive into the world of CAN. And there's apparently some people are interested in it. So I don't know if the instructor ever wants to come back and have a deep, deep dive. I think we're doing a NEMA 2000 day. No, I mean a deep dive. O scopes, protocols, all that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this would definitely be extra credit. Anyway, um, with the exception of, say it with me, backbones, drops. And where are the things on the end? Terminators. With the exception of that, and that there are multiple protocols, you can forget everything I just covered all this morning. Because 
If you truly, that's really more for your education and information. If in the real world you get to the point where you're diving to that level, something has really gone sideways and you know, it's, it's, you're going down the path incorrectly. So what we're going to talk about now is what you do need. This is the practical applications. So things like, we talked about backbone terminators at each end, we talked about differential pair, the ground reference, okay? Um, probably, uh, and remember, a subtle detail. In the NEMA 2000 world, they use that black wire in the backbone cable and the drops, that's the ground reference. That's why in the NEMA 2000 network, you have a power tap. You have to supply power into that, gets its ground reference, and there's a reason for it. In all the rest of the world, they don't use isolated uh, CAN bus. RVC doesn't, cars don't, I mean, typically don't. They never use absolutes. But in general, your ground reference is going to be your battery. And even in NEMA 2000, your ground reference is going to be your battery, because usually when that power drop comes out, you hook the black to the, to the ground and the red to a 12 volt battery, all right? Then the other kind of things that we have to worry about, a detail, is the can and the baud rate. There is how fast is these, uh, this information being sent? The actual, how quickly does the ones and zeros change? On your Victron, uh, the VE can port, NEMA 2000, RVC, Default J1939, they all run at 250K. That is the one you're always going to run across. However, on the Victron, the, the BMS CAN port, this is where you go sometimes bring in third party batteries, you know, through the Lux protocol, you know, Chinese batteries, something like that. That typically runs at 500K. So when you're setting stuff up, you know, notice the wake speed has the ability, you can change these baud rates. You'll just want to make sure the baud rates are the same. That's a detail that you will have to make sure is correct, because if one guy's speaking faster than the other one, it just ain't going to work, okay? The other big issue that we have is the, the CAN wires, the CAN high and CAN low are not connected, and that is specifically, we run across that with the uh, crossover cable with Victron. I mentioned to you about sins of the past, that the, uh, the black end, wake speed, uses a industry published standard, CIA 303. The blue end does not, uses a Victron standard. And, and there's actually a reason for that. I kind of poke fun at Victron, but there is a reason. They, they have their own sins of the past where they ended up with this. But it means that, uh, and I forget which one it is, but one and two and seven and eight are, are the pin numbers on each end. And it's documented if you go to the learn tab, get the Victron, uh, uh, install guide. It'll show you exactly what to do. That's probably one of the bigger issues we have when people are installing RJ45s. Okay. Uh, I think that's it can for I, that. Can I make an, uh, sort of an interesting, uh, you may. Important point. Yeah. Um, data terminators are yes. also uh, different wire configurations, and you can do nasty things if you try to stick a Victron data terminator in a Yeah, especially on a 48 volt, because one of the things, uh, the subtle detail is, on, R, on these uh, RJ45s, the CIA spec allows power to be transmitted over this bus, so you can have displays and stuff that are self-powered just by the Cat5 cable. Uh, Turns out the Victron uses those two pins for their can high and can low. So when you plug one of these into a wake speed, you're applying battery power to it. Now, um, 48 volt environments, that gets really fun. Okay. Uh, okay. So we've actually talked about some of this stuff, but I'm going to kind of go over it in a systematic way. As you're sitting there and designing your system, the little hint that I always start with is start out with the battery and the BMS. What is the battery system? Are you doing uh, lithium? Are you doing a Victron Lynx? Are you doing a Dynas? Are you doing somebody that has an RG45 pinouts? Is it a industrial pinout? Is it a NEMA 2000 pinout? You know, decide from the BMS first what your backbone's gonna be. Assuming you have a BMS connected battery. If you don't, then continue to make your own decision. In the marine world, I think for me, it comes down fairly simply. If you're largely doing nothing but Victron, this is the easiest way to do it. 
If you're going to connect your Victron and your wake speed into a NEMA 2000 displays because you want to see that information, I'd suggest just do this. Go with a little adapter, get our CAN enabled cables, and that just makes a clean install. Don't try to be creative and do mixed networks. I mean, you can, but just, just don't. Just keep it simple. Okay? Oh, DTM, that's that automobile standard. I probably haven't said that yet. Any questions on this? I mean, if you were just plumped down, think of installs that you might be doing. Do you have kind of a clear picture of what the CAN wiring system would look like? How you might put it together? I'm only seeing one head nod. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> you have a couple of resources you can draw on. Perfect. Yes, sir. Can you just, uh, for our benefit, clarify? I got you. I got that you said DTM is the automotive standard. Yeah. When you're looking at all the variants of connectors that one might find, do they use voice connectors or what do they use? It depends on, yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, it depends on the, 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 the kind of the wiring standard. So DTM, that is this guy. This is Dorch Miniature. Oh, gotcha. That's what that stands for. A Dorch, a DT connector is actually this guy. He's a little bit larger. You'll look at, if you want to come up and look at them, they look very much the same, but this one's smaller, right? You can come up and take a look here. Um, in terms of NEMA 2000, this is called an M12, M12-5A, I think. It's, uh, it's an M12 connector. I'm not sure exactly who is Device the... Device net is, is kind of that. Device net is the one who uses the standard. The M12 might, again, be a Dorch. I, I'm not sure who the original manufacturer is, but this is known as an M12 connector. And then these, I call RJ45. This socket is actually what is RJ45. That's where that name comes from. Okay. Does that answer your question? It does. I, okay. I, I should have known that DTM is going to be. Yeah. With the DT series and the next size up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you'll see these things, they are pervasive on engines and cars. They're just all over. Okay. All right. Uh, the protocol, the next thing you're going to have to worry about is the protocol. And the two most common ones you're going to run across is RVC and NEMA 2000. NEMA 2000 is pretty obvious in the marine world. Its use in this case is for display. So if you've got a Garmin display or you've got one of these big fancy glass panels and you want to see what the alternator temperature is, you can connect the wake speed up to your NEMA 2000 bus. You can configure that glass panel display to receive the information from the wake speed regulator, and there you'll see alternator temperature. That's primarily how you're going to interact with NEMA 2000. So when making that decision, your design decision, you want to ask your customer, what are you planning on doing? Do you want to see this wake speed information, do you want to see battery information on your NEMA 2000 display? If the answer is yes, I'd probably go toward this wiring standard. There are two hands up in the back. Yes, sir. Um, I can put the wake speed into the servo, and the servo can connect to the NEMA 2000 and display my... You could. Can I still get the wake speed stuff that way through the servo? You could. Now, this goes back to... Yes, you could, but I'm going to say don't. Because what you're doing is you're connecting the wake speed through this wiring standard to the servo, and then you're transitioning from the servo into the NEMA 2000. You're mixing the backbones. Yes, you can. I'm just going to suggest keep it simple. Put the wake speed up to your NEMA 2000 backbone this way. From Victron, get their little adapter cable, do the links up to the NEMA 2000, and just use the NEMA 2000 for the backbone. Okay? So, and that's the hardware question, right? It doesn't matter which back, what wiring system you use, as long as you've got the backbone. And the thing you're describing is, we start the backbone over here with, with device that NEMA 2000. We go into the servo when we transition to RJ45. We'll go to the wake speeds and we'll finish the backbone with RJ45. Yes, you can. I'm suggesting don't. Just 
make it all consistent, keep your life simple and move on. When you're getting paid, if you are fundamentally cheap and your cost for your time is zero, play those games. When you're doing an install for a customer and the customer is footing the bill, just make it simple. And don't just be thinking about you installing it. Think about the poor schmuck a year down the road that has to figure out what the heck was done. You don't want to be known as that prior installer or colorful adjectives associated with the prior installer word, right? Keep it simple. All right, so the protocols that we worry about, NEMA 2000, we talked about display only. Really, that's the value of NEMA 2000. It's going to let you present to the end user what's going on within their battery system and their alternator system. The other protocol we care about is RVC. RVC is the fundamental protocol that the wake speed is based on. It's because RVC has, uh, I think, 16 message types identified around the battery. The battery can tell the wake speed, what is my voltage? What is my current? What's my temperature? It can say, please charge me. Stop charging me. I'm gaining stress. Slow down. I only want this many volts. I only want this much current. By the way, I'm thinking about pulling the rip cord. You better stop. By the way, I'm pulling the rip cord. I hope you stopped. All of those messages exist in RVC. There's only one of those that exists in NEMA. So that's why we can't use NEMA for the fundamental process control. Okay? So I'll get to you in a minute. Um, so the RVC is the fundamental backbone. You cannot get away from it. You have to use RVC. Remember j 1939s on the first floor? RVC is going to occupy a part of that second floor. It has to be there if you're going to have the wake speed regulator talk to another wake speed regulator or the wake speed regulator talk to almost any battery subsystem. You can turn RVC off, part of the configuration, the advanced configuration. It will disable the ability of the wake speed to receive battery information. It'll disable the ability of the wake speed to talk to another regulator and do prioritization. All those values I said, it will disable that because it's all based on RVC. You have to have RVC. Those are the two protocols you're going to care about. If you want to, you can go to the 100-page document, and I'm looking at you. <laughs> you can go to the 100-page document. I think Appendix C, we document all the CAN messages we do. We do not give the details of the CAN messages. You can go to the respective standards. RVC publishes their standard on rvc.com. You can download it for free. NEMA 2000 publishes their standards. You can join NEMA. You can join and pay the yearly fee, and then you can buy the standard from them. So, but you can get that information. Okay. Question in the back? Well, it's just uh, wondering when you say it gets the information from the battery, you mean battery management? Yes. Not a regular battery. Right? Not a regular battery. Yeah. This is if you have a CAN enabled battery. All right? Okay. And there's other places that the wake speed can get information. It can get information from a smart shunt. It comes in actually over the CAN bus and it gets presented to the wake speed regulator. Uh, remember I told you there was one message in NEMA 2000 that was useful? Voltage, current, and temperature. We can get that from a smart shunt. So there is actually a way to install the wake speed if you've got like a Victron smart shunt with a servo that you don't eat with a traditional battery that you don't have to hook up the uh, purple and a uh, gray wire. You don't have to hook up the temperature sensor. You can actually have that come in over the NEMA 2000. You can make your choice. There's a lot between here and there. If you ever do studies on failure modes, you will understand one of the first principles is every single thing you add between here and there introduces a failure mode and decreases reliability. So your choice, you have to design the system. But that's an option that you can do. And uh, I'm looking for my clicker. There it is. All right. So the takeaway here is the two primary protocols we care about, RVC and NEMA 2000, are the two we care about. There are probably seven or eight different BMS protocols. And we'll cover this uh, when we do configuration. It's in the advanced tab where you can select an alternative configuration. So I've mentioned uh, SMA. I've mentioned LUX. These are protocols that are often used by uh, 
Chinese batteries, uh, not just Chinese batteries, it's also used by Victron, it's called, sometimes it's called the Victron BMS protocol. It's an 11-bit protocol. Um, it's a little bit less capable, but there are alternative protocols that the wake speed can, can be configured to support as well. So sometimes those will come into play, and that's why you always start with, start with your battery. Figure out what you're doing with your battery and then work from there, okay? Uh, next, we want to talk about uh, the brothers, NEMA 2000 and RVC. And this is probably the picture I'm most proud of that I found. I talked about the second floor, NEMA 2000 and RVC. These guys love each other and they absolutely hate each other. In every one of those specs, they say, doubt shall not ever transmit a message that's not in J1939 or me. So RVC says it is a violation to have a packet transmitted that's not the data page zero J1939 or the DP1 as defined by RVC. NEMA 2000 says the same thing. In the very purest sense, unless you disable one or the other of these, this will not pass a certification in those type of environments because of that. But the reality is that those two guys coexist. They have different bedrooms on that second floor. So mostly they're okay. They stay in their own room. Battery messages go out through NEMA this way. Battery message goes out through RV this way. And the world's happy. However, they do share a common bathroom. There is a small number of messages that overlap. And for those who want to take a technical detail, now is the time to pick up your pencil and get ready to write. The overlapping messages are the battery, some of the battery messages in RVC, it's called DC source status. Some of those use the same identifier. Remember I talked about the identifier says what this packet contains. Some of those use the same identifier as NEMA 2000 uses for what NEMA 1000 calls a directed fast packet. <sighs> Go dive deep in the hole again. When I showed that diagram that what a packet consists of, there was only eight bytes. And that's a very small amount of information. You can send maybe the voltage and the temperature, or maybe the current. You, know, you can send two or three things, but if, uh, if you want to send more, you have to send a separate packet. It's a very small bit of information. It's basically eight letters. So what you can send in each packet. All of these protocols have the ability to send groups of packets. It'll be called fast packet or it's, you know, there's a couple of different protocols. In NEMA 2000, they have a block of message IDs that they reserve for what they call fast packets. And it's a way they can send, I think it's 1932 bytes. Instead of eight, you can say a whole bunch. And that group starts out with a message that goes out and says, I'm going to send some fast packets. So the next 23 messages that I send is the first eight bytes, the next eight bytes, the next eight bytes, right? Uh, that is a very structured protocol. The sender has to know what it looks like. The receiver has to recognize it and be ready to grab all these messages and reassemble them because it's not getting one packet, it's getting a bunch of packets it has to reassemble and then hand off for somebody to process. Some of the DC source messages in RVC use the same identifier as some of these fast packets. Now, in the real world, what happens is, we've never, I've never heard of an issue. In the real world, what happens is, a NEMA 2000 display is going to receive this rogue packet that shows up, because it's an RVC thing with the battery temperature or something. Right? It's going to receive that message and it's going to say, well, this looks like a fast packet message, but I didn't get into this preamble. It's like, this thing's like broke. This has just showed up on doorstep. I, did, I don't know what to do with it. I didn't get the header. I didn't get all the rest of them before it. So I'm just going to ignore it. That's usually what happens. It arrives at NEMI 2000. It looks like an ill-formed fast packet fragment and it's just ignored. Yes, sir. Does it pass it on, or does it, when you say ignore, does it continue to pass it on through a backbone? Or does it uh, the backbone, remember, the backbone, everyone's hearing everything. So it's the node. The node's going to get that packet. So the battery's going to send out, here's, the, here's 
I, I don't remember which one it is. Maybe it's the voltage pack. Batteries go send out the RVC voltage. Everyone gets it. Wake speeds go over here and say, hey, thank you, battery. This Lean Me 2000 display is going to say, what the heck is this? This is like some malformed fragment of a fast packet message. I'm just going to ignore it. That's good programming standards. That's how almost everyone works. I found one device that was a very small European. It was some guy who made you know, a commercial product, very small cell. He hadn't put that code in. He found that fragmented packet and it wedged his display. But that was like, I don't want to use the word hobbyist because it was a commercial product, but it was a very small scale. You know, they maybe sold like 20, right? I mean, it's just a very small thing. So I'm belaboring on this point because these two guys, they love each other, but they do fight over this topic. And this is where that can bridge comes into play. If you have something really weird going on, and again, I've never had this show up in the real world, and, we, and I know of you know, 40 or 50 really involved NEMA 2000 display installs. Never heard this be an issue. But if it does, the answer is you get a bridge. A couple of company make them. And you have the NEMA 2000 backbone here. You have the RVC backbone here. Here's all the NEMA 2000 stuff. Here's all the RVC stuff, including wake speed. You put the bridge in the middle. And then that bridge will only receive the NEMA 2000 packets and pass it on to this NEMA 2000 backbone. If you go to the back of our reference manual, we actually have a little script that you can use with, uh, I think Yacht Dynamics is, is one of the devices. There's a script in there that shows how you can configure it to accomplish that. Okay. Have I belabored this point enough? So it's like having its own internal network, like its own hotspot pass through. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're used to like computer, like Ethernet and stuff, it's basically a, a filtering router is what it is. It just only passes through what should pass through, and the rest of the stuff stays. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. So you got devices, the guys <laughs> up in Vancouver, British Columbia, that's, that would also be a, a good source for... I think that's the example of the bridge. Yacht Devices is the little bridge device that we had one of our customers, I don't know, just because he was bored and he wanted to do this. So um, he created that script and we kind of verified it and we threw it in our appendix. So um, that's what's back there. It's for this bridge to filter out. Think of it, this is how I describe, this is how I like to think of it in metaphors. Think of it as two brothers, two bedrooms, a shared bathroom, and they're like just really angry with who gets to use it first. At some point, mom's going to come up and say, you get to use it at this time, and you get to use it this time. That's what that little bridge is, basically. Okay? Real world, never known it to be needed. If you get a customer who is aware of some of this topic, but not aware of how, whether it's relevant or not, you may get pestered on this. And if you do, there's your, that's what's going on, so you can have an intelligent conversation with the person. Okay. Ah, uh, it was mentioned before, engine data. So do you remember yesterday we talked about how the wake speed regulator considers the battery information either through independent sensors or can communicate if the battery's going to communicate that way. It considers the alternator, what's going on with the alternator. It can also consider what's going on with the engine. And kind of two of the areas that's really cool things that we can do with the engine data. We can pick up the RPMs. So that stator wire that we talked about is so problematic. If you've got a CAN enabled modern engine, and by the way, that one out there is not, nor is the one in my vessel. There's a lot of marine engines that don't have this modern electronics on it. But if you do, like the new Vols and stuff, they'll have a CAN bus. And literally what you do is you go find wherever the terminator is. I don't know why I have my terminator here. You go find where the terminator is, unplug it, you plug in the extension into the wake speed, and now the wake speed can see the engine data. It can know what the RPMs are. So if you're going to do any of that white space that we're going to talk about, we need to know what the RPMs are, bang, we get the RPMs that way. If uh, you want to know the engine loading, which is actually a great way to manage engine loading, 
so that you're not overloading the engine at low RPMs or high RPMs, that's how you can get. You remember the example, Nordhavens, and I gave you one example of somebody who had a wing engine with a hydraulics pump on it? That's how we did this. We tapped into the wing engine's J1939 bus. We received the engine loading. And when they hit the hydraulic pump, and we set the regulator to say, don't ever let the engine go over 60% engine loading. So when they hit that hydraulic pump and that engine went up to 90, 100, 110%, we backed the alternator off, tried to bring that back to 60, and it just worked. The secret is you have to get the data. Once you get the data, it's easy to set up. Yes, sir? That just seems like one of the best features you guys have put in there. If you're relying on a diesel engine and you're asking it to do hydraulic pump work mm -hmm. that's, you know, robust in its nature, like a thruster, to be able to sense the engine and process that data and tweak the alternator is just yep. really... Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, I actually agree with you. It's one of the best features. It's also the ones of the most least used features in the wake speed, that engine load management. So when we get into the configuration, we're going to get to the engine tab, and we're going to revisit this topic. That engine loading is just set and forget. Now, if you can't get that engine data, we have other ways of delivering the same value. You could, for example, use white space. Because remember, that engine loading, that engine loading at low RPMs, I'm trying to move the boat around, and I got a big giant alternator sucking 4 kilowatts out, and I try to maneuver, that engine loading's gonna go to 110%. Wake speed will back off, right? That engine loading handles that. It handles when we're trying to get up on step. When that really struggling point of, that in, of you're trying to get the boat up on plane, that's a real high energy need for putting horsepower into the water. That engine loading is going to spike, wake speed will back off. When you're up at the top, where the engine curve on planing vessels intersects with the prop loading, and you're overloading the engine, because now we're pulling 20 horsepower of the engine, and you're getting black smoke out the back, we'll back off the alternator automatically. All this stuff happens automatically. Just connect up to the engine can and set the engine loading parameter. Yes, ma'am. I've been trying to figure out from context clues what you mean by white space. Yeah. I haven't got it yet. So no. Would you go through that a little bit? We will, and we'll go into much more detail. So what white space lets us do, and the perfect example is at the very bottom end, a white space is a way to deliver this value I just talked about but we do it based on RPMs. So we say, if we're really low RPMs, then let's not let the alternator drive hard. Let's cap how hard the output the alternator can do. So there's actually little sliders based on RPMs, and we say at low RPMs, we're only going to let the alternator work this much. And as RPMs go up, we'll slide up and, and go down. It, it becomes, and I'll explain much more detail, but it's a way to deliver this kind of same value, where at low RPMs, you back the alternator off, and at high RPMs, you back the alternator off, and at the hump, you have a way of backing it off. Without having J1939 data, you have to have RPM data, though. Could you maybe say what the name means? Yeah. OK, sure. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Good luck. Can, can you guys see over here, if I draw here? OK. Um, Here's like RPMs. In grade school, I, my teacher said that we had to put our arm like this or she's going to have the custodian come in and make a shelf. So I still remember that. Dark, dark periods. And here's something we're just going to call this power for whatever. So a typical engine, as you increase RPMs at idle, it doesn't make a lot of, doesn't make a lot of power. And a typical engine has a curve that looks like this, right? And as you go up higher, you've all seen this. In a vessel, the prop loading curve will look like this. Have you guys seen this? So at very low RPMs, a prop doesn't have the ability to put much power in the water. The prop loading is very low. On Viking Star, the maximum amount of power, my prop, and there's formulas, all sorts of science around this. I can put 58 horsepower 
into the water at max RPMs. At low RPMs, well, when you're not moving, you're putting zero in. So this starts at zero and then goes up. The thing is, these curves don't match. These curves are different. On a plane, now on Viking Star, my engine curve actually looks like this. I mean, it's way off the top. The engine produces 120 horsepower at max, so I'm never able to fully load it. I've actually propped my vessel. And if you guys get into this, it's what's called overprop. I usually run in this space to try to get these curves closer to gear to be more fuel efficient on that efficiency, right? But this is a typical horsepower, engine horsepower prop curve. Um, there are some subtleties, and I'm going to put a little bump here like this. And I don't, you know, this, when you have a plane vessel, you're going to get a little spike, and then it returns back down. That's when you're trying to get over the hump and up on plane. There's like you need a little bit extra push. On planing vessels, typically, that's the most efficient point of operating because it's the, where you're going to burn your fuel the most efficiently because of the hull form. On planing vessels, when the engineers, when the boat designers make their vessels and design the engine to the prop, they will often design this point to intersect because people who own planing vessels, they want to go fast. And when they fire all that throttle, they want to think they're back in a PT-73 and they want to go fast and they want to make sure that every horsepower of that engine can go into the prop. What that means is, not on Viking Star, that means you've got a planing vessel, you're producing 400 horsepower and you're delivering 400 horsepower into the water. You're putting as much power into the water to move that vessel as the engine can produce. There's no room left for the alternator. So at this point, the engine's at 100% loading. Yeah, they usually don't do 100%. They leave a little, you leave headway, you leave margin in there for various reasons. Usually we bring them up to about 90% loading in the real world. But what you want to do in this point, look, if we're pulling 30, 40 horsepower of the engine for the alternator, we can't do that at this point. We have to back it off. Same way down here, if we're trying to pull 20 horsepower out of the engine, we can't do it because the engine can't make horsepower. White space is this distance this area in between. This is opportunity to apply additional loading from the alternator. And maybe when we apply the alternator and the prop, we end up with a curve that looks more like this. So down here, almost all of our power is on the green line. It's going to the prop and we're putting two or three horsepower into the alternator. Up here, all of our engine's horsepower is going into the prop. We're putting 390 horsepower into the prop. The engine makes 400. We're basically putting four horsepower. Here in the middle, we have lots of opportunity because the prop can only take 40 horsepower and the engine makes 100. We can load up 40 or 50 horsepower into the alternator. So what you will do is you will define a white space curve for the regular that looks like this, looks like a football. And when you get into that, you'll see it. You can define these little sliders and you'll make a slider that's low here, low here, high here. And you may choose to make a little bump here because that, you know, reduce the alternator horsepower output, alternator demand on the horsepower to get us up on plane. Does that explain that all? Okay, where the phrase white space come from has nothing to do with this. Because that's the question you really ask. Um, do you remember in school when you turned your reports in and you got all the nasty diagram uh, comments from your instructor. They'd write them on the white space on the paper. Those are the margins on the edge of the paper, the white space of the paper. That's where that phrase actually came from, uh, but we've kind of absorbed it and we used it for this. This is unused potential, just like you had unused paper, unused potential where you could uh, apply to the old Yes, sir. Okay. You sold me. I want to know about the white space. How do I do this on a non NEMA 2000 or a network? Exactly, and that's the difference. The easiest way to accomplish this value of making sure that we don't have dodgy performance at low RPMs and that we don't overload the engine at high RPMs, tap into the engine data, set the loading curve and say, 
Never load this engine up more than 90%. So what we'll do, if this is the output of the engine, we'll just simply say, hey, alternator, make sure we never no load. And you know, pick a number or 90%, pick like 60% or something like that. We'll just say, never load the engine more than that. And that way, the alternator will back off down at these points here where there's not any extra space and at these points where there's not extra space. If you can't do that, and that is the best way to do it, it's the easiest way to do it, hook up two wires, set one number, and go to lunch. If you can't do that, then you have to get the RPMs into the wake speed somehow, either through a stator wire or through a J1939 or through a NEMA 2000, and you declare the white space. In addition, um, there are other things that the uh, engine loading solves automatically. If you're doing cogen, like that example of the hydraulic pump, if you use engine loading, that number, it automatically happens. Because you throw that hydraulic pump on, engine loading goes high, wake speed says, oh, too much, we'll back off the alternator. If you don't have access to the data, you can define the RPMs of the white space. Then, to deliver the value of the engine loading on that hydraulic, we're really getting into advanced features now, you would take the white feature in wire and you would connect that up to whatever it is, that, uh, the clutch on that hydraulic pump. So when that clutch is on the hydraulic pump, you would select a different mode of operation of the wake speed. So very specifically, you remember yesterday we talked about normal mode, half power mode. We talked about normal mode and small alt mode with the little dip switch eight. Do you guys remember that? Do you remember saying there was a third parameter called half power? You can configure the feature in wire to select half power. And what you would do in this case is you would have to figure out in your head how much I have to back the alternator off to account for that hydraulic pump. So when you're normally running, you may run the alternator up to 100%. When that hydraulic pump is running, you may say, I can only drive the alternator at 20%. So you would set that parameter at 20%, hook this up to your hydraulic pump, hook this up to your stator wire, go in and find the white spaces. This is how with a legacy or an analog connection, you can accomplish these customer values. Now, if you want to do it the easy way, figure out where to connect this up and set a number on that same tab that says 60%. And all that stuff will get done. Okay? Yes, sir? Is that also how you use like a preset for high idle? So say I'm on, I'm, on, I'm on a sailboat, I want to high idle my engine and just charge my batteries as fast as possible. Would it, is that what I would use? That kind of preset? Or is that a separate feature? You could definitely do that. I mean, these are where we're getting in the system designs. Wake speed's very flexible, has a lot of features. These are some of the things you can do. So for example, let's say at um, this RPM right here, I want another color, right here, perfect. Let's say at this RPM right here is my high idle. Well, when I'm moving the boat, I'm going to do this much to the alternator, but I've capped it because I've defined white space. But I actually have more room available to drive the alternator because I'm not driving a prop. So I could actually use this energy and direct it toward driving the alternator. You can configure the feature in wire to only use white space during certain times. So for example, if the vessel's moving, you could say apply white space. And if it's not, you could say ignore white space. Just drive the alternator as it can. React when it's in that white space, and then I understand you're not using the prop, or what yeah. happens when there's a malfunction with the engine, or it's starting to run out of spec. How does it, I mean, how fast? Can I say, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure if you heard the questions. He's going, What happens when things go in the ditch? Yeah. Right? Um, it, the, the failure modes is something, that, definitely something to think about and consider. Uh, what'll happen is, uh, you can, <sighs> there are many ways to skin this cat. So let's say, for example, you run out of fuel and the engine stops, right? Well, you could use that little oil pressure twig, 
If you did that, that'll turn the regulator off, right? You could define the parameter in the wake speed. If it knows the RPMs, there's actually a parameter you can say if the RPMs are below a certain amount, turn the engine, you know, turn it off. That's another way you could skin that cat. Um, if you had things going sideways, like you drop the injector, I don't know what's going to happen. If you got a legacy, uh, old mechanical engine. Tired. I mean, yeah. Sailboats. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. If you drop a cylinder, if you drop an injector, you're probably just going to get a ton of black smoke out of the back and get a service call. If it's an electron controlled engine, the ECU might recognize it and signal to the wake speed, hey, something's going wrong. So can't really answer all those things. Yeah. But it is a marvelous question, and I really hope every one of you, since we're spending two days here, I hope you not only understand how to install basic wake speed, but also how to do some of these higher reliability features. We're going to talk about this after lunch, but there are things like what happens if I'm connected to the CAN with the BMS and that connection goes away? What do you want the regulator to do? There's lots of options you can do. What happens if? I lose engine RPMs. What do you want to do? Lots of options there. There's a lot of things the wake speed can detect, and you can declare how you want the behavior of the system, the regulator to behave, as part of your system design. Okay? Does that answer your question? Yep. Perfect. Yes, sir. Uh, as far as getting the power curves to determine the wet fit, is that the kind of thing where you would have to go to your engine manufacturer? Engine manufacturer, yeah. And, and they may or may not give them to you. And they may be marketing documents, you know, basically <laughs> liar sheets, but you know, that's, yeah, that's where you would go, right. Yes, sir. So I know we have some commercial fisher folk in this yes. room. Yeah. And it just occurs to me that uh, commercial fishing boats, the exposure I've had to, had to them, there is no limit to what one of those main propulsion engines will think is a great source for PTO, fill in the blanks. Exactly. We're going to run this. We're going to run hydraulic pumps directly yeah. off the crankshaft. We're yep. going to do it with electric clutches. We're going to run multiple alternators. We're going to do all this stuff. Yeah. So in a legacy engine, yeah. um, well, how would you advise the, the techs in this room that are eventually going to find themselves in a problem-solving situation on a source of fishing boat? Would you say keep it simple and get as much data as you can to feed into the wake speed for configuring it to optimize the alternator and the battery management? Or would you say it, in some cases it might make sense to advise uh, the owner, the vessel owner, oh, you know, this is a candidate for converting a legacy engine to be more like a can enabled engine by changing all the sensors? Yeah. So, um, I am remembering when I went to school. And when I went to school, my computer science degree, one of them was called Computer I.O. And we dealt with what was known as the very first commercially viable IBM, an IBM 1401. Came out in the 50s. And it was a marvelous machine. And it did DTL and, you know, this old guy, little spark plug of a person, had retired from IBM and had all sorts of stories that he, you know, would impress college students with, and 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 give us little things by pulling out boards and putting scotch tape over it and saying, "Oh, this doesn't work. Find it." Right. One of the things that was fabulous about that machine, and that's the machine that started, like when you got computer printed mailings, it came from a printer, uh, 1407, I think it was called. When they had the tapes that went around came from there. When it, all that stuff started with that machine, the printer itself was called a chain printer and it was heads and tails better than anything else I ever invented. It was also better than anything else that came out 20 years later. A lot of those 1401s existed purely to drive the printer. The printer was a legacy analog machine where you added this pump here and you pumped there and you did everything. It was rated at 600 lines per minute. We had a competition that the instructor gave us. How fast can you make this printer go? Now this is a mechanical machine. It was old, it was tired. I think the record was like 684 lines per minute before you start getting crap on the print on the page. So that was our competition. One of the stories that he would pass on is because these things could be tweaked, 
if he had a customer that he liked, his personal record was 790 lines per minute. And he would come in once a week and turn this little knob and turn this one shot and adjust this to get that 790 lines per minute. For the customers who were wankers, that machine was set for 400 lines uh, per minute and he never saw him again. He'd come in once a year when he was told he had to. Coming back to your question, I can't answer you. So you got to depend on who the customer is. Is this a customer, and it's not a case of a customer you like or you don't like. It's a case of what are the needs? You know, fishing commercial vessels, they are there to serve a purpose. They're a tool. So you have to make sure that whatever you put in satisfies that needs first and foremost, right? So if you've got all this kind of stuff going on and you want to take advantage of some of this stuff, well, maybe you set it up for 400 lines per minute. You are very conservative, right? You get one signal wire in and, and you just deal with one thing and it gives good values and because you're a 32 volt system and they're burning up batteries all the time and now you're not going to burn up batteries, they're very happy about it, right? But that is the right answer for that customer. Or you've got somebody that says, I've read all these glossy magazines, I'm all these forums, I don't want to be on the leading edge. Well then fine, you can tune it up to 750 lines per minute. And if you've got multiple pumps on it, you may even sit down and buy a beer for your favorite engineer who's going to teach you what an orange diode system looks like. Whoops and tell you to run that to your feature end wire, run that to hydraulic pump one, and that to hydraulic pump two, and that to hydraulic pump three, and if any one of those guys go active, you'll activate that guy. All right, so that's my answer to that, and, and, and the real truthful answer is, you have to know what the customer wants, what he's looking for out of his vessel. Is, he, is this something that's not gonna be around for long, fishing vessels around forever? You know, how much how much do they want to be pushing an optimizing thing? There's a phrase, the evil of good is better. Good is good. Just because you can make it better doesn't mean you should. So in the spirit of, you know, less is more, keep it simple. But, you know, in my, in my example, yeah. I think we can all agree what a, what a commercial fishing boat <laughs> captain wants is a robustness and reliability <coughs> yep. to do the work that it's yep. there to do. Yep. So, uh, but increasingly efficiency is, is important. This stuff ain't cheap. You know, if you could go out, if you could, you know, back in the day when you could go to a dyno in Seattle and pick up a bunch of batteries for 400 bucks, who cares if you've burned them every two years? Diesel fuel costs 49 cents a gallon. Who cares? Now we're in an environment where it's five, six, seven thousand dollars for those batteries and diesel fuel is like four bucks a minute, right? So it's a different world. So those are the things that, that you might want to uh, consider a bit. All right, so um, I got two more slides and then we will break. Um, no, before we do that, I'm going to come back to one thing here. Vehicles. All of these engine loading values I've been talking about has been very much in the marine space. This applies to trucks and cars even more so. Perfect example. Those little Sprinter vans, some of them come with little teeny turbo diesels. Turbo diesels are great. They make a lot of power when you get them up on their legs. When they're starting, they make nothing. You're like opening the door and putting your foot out, trying to get it going. We had a customer, actually, who bought one of our products, installed it, and he loves it. And then I get a phone call. He, uh, he had gotten back from a camping trip in the Cascades. And he had parked his van overnight on the incline at 3,500 feet. He couldn't get the truck to move. The alternator was pulling so much power at idle that they couldn't get the truck to start. There was so little energy available. His solution is the solution you're going to hear about all the time. Well, I'll just put a switch on the dashboard, turn the regulator off. How many people have helms with switches everywhere to turn this off, turn this off, right? It's the old school solution. And it worked for him. Turned it off, he could get up the hill. Had he connected in to the chassis J939 bus, 
we would have realized that we we're pulling 70, 80, 90% engine loading. We would have backed the alternator off automatically. We would have solved this problem. No switch needed. Another area, you're trying to accelerate. You're trying to get that turret, sorry, that pig up an on-ramp, right? Get up to the freeway speed because you don't want to get crushed. Put the metal to the pedal. We'll realize engine loading's high. We'll back the alternator off. You're trying to make a pass. You're going up a hill. All this stuff will happen automatically if you tap into the engine data. And it's a massive value. And I will tell you, I know of no one who is using it today. It's been there for years. No one's using it today. Massive value in the RV space. Massive differentiator. You have a product that will be better than anyone else's because no one else can do this in this way. By the way, that same guy, he called me here the other day. He's up uh, in the North Country on the North Slope. He said, oh man, this wake speed's broke. It's not charging my batteries. And now I'm out in the you know, toolies and I need this thing to charge. You hit the nail on the head. <laughs> it took him a little while to realize he had turned the alternator off for some reason and forgot to turn it back on again. And yes, he was very embarrassed. And yes, we had the conversation about how unreliable carbon-based control units are. They're horrible. They just are. Deliver the value in a way that's going to work. And it works. And it works beautifully. And it's proven. It's been there for years. It's a marvelous value. In the marine space, I will guarantee you, you're going to run across people all the time. We, do, we have it all the time now. We have guys that want to put a switch on their helm in the brown wire so they can turn the regular off. They want to put a switch in the white wire so they can force the regular into half power mode. And it's just like, why are you doing this? Well, I need to control stuff. It's like white space. Hook up one wire and Bob's your uncle and you're done. But there you go. The old world versus the new world. Okay. Um, some more subtleties and details. Oh, sorry. Subtleties and details. There is a aspect of CAN that you will need to know called instance. Do you remember I said that all these protocols define how the data is used, what it means? Many of these packets have what's known as an instance. And it's a way to differentiate different, ver different realizations of the same device. Perfect example is you've got a twin engine installed with two wake speed regulators. If they send out the CAN messages reporting their status with the same instance, whoever's receiving them won't know where it's port or starboard. So instead, what they do is this becomes instance one and this becomes instance two. So that way, when that NEMA 2000 display receives this information, it knows whether it's the port engine or the starboard engine. Instances come into play with the battery and the BMSs. There are battery instances. There are uh, charger instances, which are relative to the wake speed. And then there are engine instances. And this is going to become a problem for you guys in the marine world. All these J1939 messages that I just got talking about that do marvelous things, they all come out with a preamble that says, I am instant zero. And that's going to be this engine. If you have a twin engine, you want this engine to come out and say, I'm instance one, and here's my loading. And it can be done. It absolutely can be done. It is never done. Every twin engine install, both engines come with engine instance zero. And here's why. Because you've got really big boat manufacturers who think they're really big and really important, and they're going to call up John Deere and say, yeah, I need instant zero for my port and instant one for my starboard. And John Deere's going to say, okay, 20 container minimum for instance one. Where do you want us to deliver it? And it's like, that doesn't happen. So what it means is it can happen, but it never does. In reality, what's going to happen in your world, both those J1939 messages, the first floor, they're all going to be with instance zero. And this is where NEMA 2000 comes in and helps you. So the wake speed regulator can pick up engine loading data. We can pick it up from the first floor through J1939. 
We can also pick it up on that brother that lives in this bedroom, the Neiman 2000 bedroom, because that has a message that talks about RPMs and, and engine loading. So if you want to use this type of feature, if you want to feed engine data into the wake speed, what you're going to do, you're going to have to add a little engine data bridge. And they're pervasive. They all exist. They come in one of two forms. One form is they have two CAN buses. One connects to a J1939. There goes to NEMA 2000. You go in and configure it, and you say where this is engine 0 or 1, and you do the name and all the stuff. You have to configure the device. And then the wake speed, and you do the same thing with the air engine. And that way, the wake speed gets messages that says, here's my port loading. Here's my starboard loading. You have to configure the regular air where which engine instance to listen to, there are, you know, one or two. And then that's how that all works. These little devices also come with legacy analog sensors. You can buy them that have an oil pressure sensor and an RPM and a voltage and just wires that come out and digitize it and present it as NEMA 2000. That's another way you can accomplish the same thing. This is a detail that you in the marine industry are going to have to be aware of. And it's a complexity, and that's, that's what the issue is, and that's how you would solve it. Yes, sir. So If I set up my wake speed and in six months I try to figure out what I did, mm -hmm. is there a way to actually uh, go in and see what I did? Or well, my answer would be you would go to your ship's document that you have saved away and you could see everything you did, including the configuration and everything. Uh, there is actually inside the wake speed, you can pull the configuration out with the app. You can retrieve it. It loses some details. So the app, we talk about what's the brand of the battery and what's the model number. You lose that detail because the wake speed doesn't care what brand it is. It just needs to know how big it is, right? It doesn't need to know what color it is. But yes, there is a way to do it. But my recommendation, my, and that's usually why this is done. My suggestion when you're doing an install, take your notes, configure the regulator, save that configuration file away, have a folder on your computer, part of your ship's records, give that to the customer so they have it as well. That would be my recommendation. Okay. And by the way, I would also recommend when you do that, take a copy of the firmware that is presently being used, save that as a way. So down the road, if you have to do a replacement, you can put in exactly the same thing that was done. Even if we're two or three generations ahead, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it had been working for 20 years and you got struck by lightning, unless you have a compelling reason to use a newer version of firmware, I'm conservative. I say, if it worked for, 20, you know, for five or 10 years, put it back exactly the same way. Now, it could be there are new features that you want to take advantage of. Of course, then you would update. But that would be my recommendation. Save away your design drawings. Save away the actual configuration file, the, the text files. And then also save away a copy of the firmware. Okay. Can we go back through and like when you release those firmware packets, are, do you store those previous versions? Like if we need to get a legacy. We. Um, we actually don't make them publicly available, but you can contact our support. I mean, we have them. We just don't have them out there. Okay. Yeah. If I need that old one. If you need to, you can contact support and they'll help you out. But no, it's not. List it on the website. You know, we just list the most latest one. And we list the latest one and encourage people to use the latest one, right? All right. Um, so bottom line, this engine ID instance, if you've got a single engine, it's easy. Just connect the wake speed up to the CAN bus. We'll receive all this data off the first floor, J1939. If you have twin engines, you're going to have to do this translation with NEMA 2000 so that we have separate engine instance because this engine, his first floor is going to say he's engine zero, he'll translate into engine two. This one's going to say he's engine zero, he'll translate into engine one, and then the wake speed can listen on the NEMA 2000 bus. So that's kind of the bottom line. Single engine, connect it up. Twin engine, you got to do this NEMA 2000 uh, converter. Any questions on this? All right, we got one more slide. And uh, then, then we're going to go into the configuration of the wake speed, which I, I think we'll just take a break. So first off, we're going to talk about this. 
These are kind of some hints, and we've kind of alluded to these a little bit already. How do you do troubleshooting? Okay. The very first thing is if all, everything's working, how do you know it's working? With the Wake Speed 500, if we have a CAN BMS, the very first thing you're going to look for is the LED. It will display three colors. It'll display green, which means it's in standalone mode. It'll display red, which means there's either a, a failure, it's one of the failure modes, or it's in a fault mode. Or it'll display yellow, amberish type color. That means it's in slave mode. So if you have lead acid batteries in twin engine install, and you've connected up two regulators with a terminator plugged in on this side and a Cat5 cable over the other side and a terminator. When you fire those two engines up, one of the regulators, I don't know which one, one's going to stay green, the other one's going to color shift to the yellow amber. What that means is this is the master, this is the one that's controlling the charge process, and that guy's in slave mode. He will follow the directions from this guy. That's another one of the values of the wake speed. We don't have them fighting each other when charging the battery. They'll work with each other. This guy is the boss, the one blinking green. He says, here's what we're going to do. And the guy that's blinking yellow, amber, he's in slave mode. So a very quick and easy bring up and test, look for that color shift on one of these two. If you have a BMS, part of the CAM protocol, a BMS can say, I also know what's going on with the battery and I'm smarter than you. When the wake speed sees that, this is part of the RVC protocol, he will see the BMS as a higher priority. This green guy will do the color shift and he'll also become a slave. So in that scenario where you've got a BMS connected to a wake speed regular, you want to look for the color shift. First and foremost, that's the easiest bring up. Look for the color shift. It takes about 10 seconds. Rick yesterday mentioned there's that engine warm up delay. We can, the shortest you can do it is 15 seconds. The reason why is the wake speed regulator is looking around to see if there's somebody it needs to lock onto as a slave. So that's the first and foremost, you want to see that color shift. If you don't see that color shift and you expected it, you likely have a problem with your CAN backbone or a configuration issue. You need to troubleshoot that. No color shift, it's not going to be working. You need to verify the protocols. Uh, you also need to look at the wiring. You need to look at the, uh, the backbones and everything. If you've got something else on the CAN network, you want to make sure the CAN network itself is working. There are some times that the CAN can be brought down because you've got too many terminators or you haven't hooked up any terminators. So if you happen to have a NEMA 2000 display, see if the NEMA 2000 display is receiving information from the wake speed. See if your servo is receiving information from the wake speed. See if the servo sees information from the battery. Use other things, other nodes on this CAN network. The reason you have a CAN network, all these guys talk with each other. See if any of these other guys can talk with each other. See if the AIS is able to send uh, position information to the chart plotter. If all that stuff works and you don't see the color shift, well, your backbone's probably okay. You need to focus on making sure you have this configured correctly. If none of this other stuff works, then your backbone's probably down. You need to focus on what's going on there. Okay? Um, I think that's about it. I think we're ready for a break.